Okay, there are almost 40 participants. I think we can get started. So hello everyone and um, welcome back to ASIC seminar series. This is our first seminar in 2022. It's very exciting. And I'm John, the seminar coordinator, and I will be the moderator with Miss um, Kathy Medley. Kathy is our communication specialist. And um, also uh, our associate director, um, Rob Ferrero um, joined us and he will be introducing our um, speaker. Just so you know that um, this video is, uh, this seminar is being recorded and the video will be um, published on our um, YouTube channel. So um, feel free to check out. And after the speaker's presentation, you can um, unmute yourself and bring up any questions. Uh, you can also um, chat us the questions. Um, so um, I, I'm going to turn this over to um, our associate director, Ralph Ferrero, and so then he can introduce the speaker. Ralph, um, okay. please go ahead. All right, yeah, thanks, John. Um, so yeah, I have the pleasure of introducing our sp first speaker of the spring semester, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Barnes. She's a professor at uh, Colorado State University um, and her research focus is, is mostly on uh, climate variability and change, although she does a few other things um, as well. And um, Professor Barnes, a member of the Academy of Sciences, uh, Earth Science and Applications from Space. And um, she's also uh, involved with a few other important groups. And uh, just reading her bio here, uh, previously she, she's won all sorts of uh, recognition um, from the AGU, actually quite impressive, and uh, also some some honors from the um, University, uh, Colorado State University. Uh, and she's got her degrees, um, University of Minnesota and University of Washington. And uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna turn it over to her. She's gonna give an interesting talk on viewing anthropogenic, anthropogenic change through an AI lens. So um, turn it over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Ralph, can you hear me? Thumbs up. Okay, perfect. And for those few of you with your videos on, thank you. It makes me remember I'm not speaking to outer space. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the introduction. It's really fun to be with your first speaker of, of the semester or quarter um, or series. So welcome. Oh, thank you. More faces. I love it. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about viewing anthropogenic change through an AI lens. And this is work. I hope you, the, the main idea to get across is I'm having a lot of fun and I think some of these AI tools out there can help you have a lot of fun too. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, and the way I think we can get creative with these tools to study the earth system in new ways, um, but still be doing the science that we know and love that got us here today. So before I jump in, I want to really acknowledge this has truly been a group effort. This is my current group. This is actually as of, I think, last week. So this is my current group. And a lot of the work I'm doing is with these brilliant graduate students and postdocs who are sitting thinking with me, like, how can we use this? Is the way the computer science community is using AI, is that the way we as climate scientists should be using AI? Um, so much of the work I'm going to talk about is really forming from discussions with this wonderful group um, of early career scientists. All right, so just let's take a pause here before we jump into AI and just talk about all the tools that we already use to be earth scientists or geoscientists. We have a really big toolbox already. We use theory, say spectral analysis, correlation, or just drawing a line. Lines are great. They tell us a lot about our data and what's going on. EOF or PCA analysis, we have data assimilation, and then one of our most powerful tools right now are dynamical models, like climate models that actually can help us simulate so many different processes and understand our changing climate. So here I want to start off from the very first slides and make it clear, I see machine learning as an additional tool to be added to this toolbox. I am not here to tell you how it's going to solve all of your problems or how it should be used instead of any of these others. Rather, it's merely the screwdriver amongst a big other set of tools that you already have, you know, in your closet, if you will. Okay, so in my view, one of our jobs as scientists is, is to sift through piles of data and try to extract useful relationships that apply elsewhere. 
Now, from a machine learning perspective, you will call this, you're looking for relationships that are applicable out of sample. As a scientist, I would just say you're looking for physical laws and relationships that govern our entire world and universe, okay? So, in many ways, machine learning methods are designed to look for relationships in data, and that's sort of what we already are trying to do. The hope is that they can, machine learning tools can help us find the relationships that us as scientists are interested in finding. Now, there are a lot of examples out there already of machine learning for climate science. Just the past two to three years has seen a huge explosion. Um, and, and I'll go through a few uh, here, global weather prediction, downscaling, extreme event detection, you know, you could each have a spe you could have a speaker on each of these topics. Um, here, I just want to, for fun, show an example that you may not have seen before, and it's one of my absolute favorites because it shows that creativity of a scientist coming out. So, a colleague of mine saw this YouTube video that came out from NVIDIA. They make GPUs or graphics cards, among other things. And in this video, they show how they trained AI to replace pieces of an image that had been zeroed or whited out. So in this case, they went in and erased this part of the image, and they'd already trained an AI to go and fill in that missing piece. And as you can see, the algorithm just figured out that an eye needed to go there, good. But if you zoom in really closely, you might notice that the makeup is wrong. So it's, it's not perfect here, but at least got an eye. Interesting, cool. But this is one of the things I find so much fun. This is the commercial sector application. And my colleagues said, that looks a lot like temperature reconstruction. So he actually went and contacted NVIDIA and used the exact same machine learning model that was trained to, to do this problem with the model's eye in this case, and updated it ever so slightly, and I can talk about the details during questions, to take in um, uh, missing data fields from temp you know, temperature records and then fill in those missing values. Now, we have lots of methods already as scientists to do temperature reconstruction from past data. This is yet another way to do it. One of the neat things, though, about this particular approach was that um, there has been quite a bit of evidence in, in write, written records of a very strong El Nino in 1877, people in South America noticing very large swings in temperature and precipitation. And most reconstruction methods are unable to replicate a strong El Nino at that time. However, without training or trying to make the machine learning method do it, it automatically showed a very strong El Nino pattern when it filled in the temperature for 1877, suggesting that it's learning relationships of temperatures across the globe to figure out the temperatures in missing locations. So that's just one fun example that I, that I like to bring up. But again, there are many others. I mentioned extreme event detection. Another great one is people are starting to use machine learning to actually learn physical equations themselves. That is, the inputs are different um, combinations of variables, and the machine learning algorithm or data-driven algorithm helps learn which of those combinations of variables should go together into a dynamical tensor to actually create a dynamical equation. That is, most people think machine learning and equations are sort of the opposite of each other, and the beauty of this approach is they're actually merged together quite nicely. All right, um, other examples being used are pure weather prediction models driven only by AI. Uh, this is exciting for many reasons. I will say it's not, these methods no, do not beat current best dynamical models, but there are some arguments for why they could still be useful. For example, in creating 1,000 member ensembles in a matter of seconds and convective parameterizations in climate models and just climate model improvements in general are a big area of interest for people doing AI and climate. And the last one I wanna point out that I don't think we should forget is even if you don't need this tool to learn new science, sometimes it can be useful to communicate your science. For example, there is a group um, out of Canada who is using a special kind of machine learning algorithm to actually take an image and show you what it might look like under, um, in inundation from sea level rise or storm surge. This really helps people start to sort of appreciate what climate change might mean for their local neighborhood. Now, as a scientist, why might you wanna use machine learning? Well, I think there are really three options, three or four, depending on how you slice it. The first is just to do it better. Convector parameterizations in climate models are not perfect and people are trying right now to use machine learning to make them more accurate. Another is just to do it faster or cheaper. 
For example, radiation code in climate models is very slow, even though we know it pretty darn well. And so there, people are exploring using machine learning methods just to make the com computations faster than using the analytical approach. And finally, even without those two, it may be worse and it may be slower, but maybe we can still learn something new from the data that we didn't know before. And as a scientist, I would argue this is still absolutely worthwhile. Um, it's, and it's especially an important part of climate science is looking for these relationships that we didn't know were there. So today I'm gonna go through just a few examples. Um, well, my first example is gonna be an example of how we are doing it faster or cheaper. And then my examples two and three, when we look for anthropogenic change are gonna be examples of learning something new. So if you will, this is the driving question of my entire talk. Humans are changing the earth in profound ways, but how does that differ around the planet and how has it changed over time? So the first example today is gonna to be thinking about um, human pressures on the land surface. Then we're gonna to change to looking for climate change in maps of, of different or scientific variables or geophysical variables. And then the third is gonna be detecting drivers of global change. All right, example one, human footprint on the land surface. So. Humans are changing the land surface. There's no question about that. Just think about your driveway or, or a road. This wasn't there hundreds of years ago um, or even maybe a decade ago. So mapping the effects of human pressure on the land surface as a, at a global scale is a significant undertaking and many people are doing this already. Um, there, it's a lot of effort and because of the amount of effort to try and look for where humans have made impacts on the land, um, current efforts to to actually do this tend to lag the present day by about five or more years. So any method we have that can help us capture this very quick extensive change that's happening in years, not decades, could be worthwhile. Um, so more up-to-date methods can also provide a complementary method for tracking change than maybe we're already doing on the ground. So one example of an already pre-existing metric that has been used extensively um, in other fields is what's called the Human Footprint Index, or the HFI. Here's an example of that HFI for the year 2000. And this group, who has been outputting this for a while now, um, creates this metric where the purple colors are near zero, which means no human impact on that land surface grid box, and the yellows and bright colors mean significant amounts in that area. You can think like shopping malls and concrete parking lot, or you know, asphalt parking lot. So how do they come up with this metric? Well, they use a, an array of data sets that they put together, built environments, population density, nighttime lights, so satellite imagery, croplands, pastures, no navigable waterways, papers. They collect, you know, they, they have to collect all this information, put it together and come up with this, with this number. Um, and again, this is a data set that's used extensively and, and great. Okay. So the question here wasn't, oh, this is a bad method, we need to make it necessarily better, but it was how can we do this faster? So what we did was we, me and my colleagues here, um, we said, well, can we come up with a, an estimate of this human footprint index from Landsat imagery alone, of which we have quite a bit of. That is, we're gonna input three small images of a Landsat image here, as you can see, hopefully you can see from the little image there that you can sort of see some roads going through and maybe some, some lots or some farms. So it's not a large image here. Just we're gonna input these images from Landsat and we're gonna train a typical, a, a type of neural network or machine learning algorithm called the convolutional neural network to take in that image and predict the human footprint index. Now, before I go there, you might say, well, where's this Landsat imagery coming from? Well, this made our lives so much easier there is a data set that's already been cleaned up and the clouds have been removed to produce every year an approximate Landsat cloud-free image for the entire globe. Because with clouds, that would get in the way of us looking for what the land surface looks like. So this data set already exists, so we were able to use that right out of the box. And again, we are doing this for many locations on the globe. So when it comes to a data size problem, this is this was a lot for me, I'll put it that way. I know some of you here on the call may think, oh, this is peanuts, but for me, this was a lot of data. So the goal here is to take in these small little snapshots of Landsat and predict the human footprint index in the middle of those snapshots. That is, we wanna predict 
a value between zero and one, where one is a high impact and zero is no impact. And here's the really important part of this that I want to be very clear. We could not have done this without the already created human footprint index, because to train our neural network, we have to know what the right answer is. Otherwise, we couldn't have done this. So this is an example of, of us working together with current methods in the toolbox to try and produce something else. So here's the original HFI method in the bottom left, and here's our machine learning HFI that all that it took to, in order to make these predictions were images from that cloud-free Landsat imagery. Now, you're gonna look at this and say, Libby, I have no way to compare. Is it good? Is it bad? Yeah, you can't tell here. We have many metrics in the paper arguing that this is actually a pretty good prediction um, and does very well over most regions of the globe. So this is comparing for the year 2000. And you might say, well, we already had a human for, for, for the year 2000. Why didn't you go and make another one? We didn't need it. Ah, but here's, here's what we've done. We now have a box, if you will, that can take any Landsat image and output a new prediction of the human footprint index on an image it has never seen before. If you will, we have a box now we can turn a crank on new imagery. So we can take Landsat imagery from, in this case, the year 2019, and create an up-to-date human footprint map that was unable to be created before. So in this case, this is the MLHFI's estimate of the human footprint index in 2019. And if I go back and forth a little bit, you can start to see the colors change as um, humans ex continue to expand into new regions of the globe. If you're interested in this data, by the way, it is both of these, the data that went into making these beautiful maps um, is all on GitHub and freely available. All right, so we've created this, this up-to-date metric. Now I know it's 2022, it's not 2019 anymore when we did this work, but we could now take, say, 2021 Lancet imagery, and in a matter of maybe an hour, I could produce a new map for that for the globe. All right, fine, but are these predictions any good? As I said, I've done some metric calculations um, that I'm not showing you here that suggest the predictions are pretty good, but how can we still get a feeling for whether our black box machine learning model is getting the right answer for the right reasons? And this is the concept of we need to open the black box. That is, we need to start to explain the decision-making process of our machine learning method in part so we can trust that what it's outputting makes sense. So there are many um, examples of this already in our field over the last few years. And here are three sort of overview papers um, coming out of climate and meteorology that may be of interest. Now, there are lots of methods out there to explain these tools. And one of them is one that my group uses, among others, which is called layerwise relevance propagation. It is a big mouthful. We're going to call it LRP. But the most important thing I want you to remember, it is one of many tools that does about the same thing. That is, we wanna understand how the network came to its decision. So let me give you an example here from one of the papers of the, the computer scientists who developed this method. Let's say we've trained a neural network to predict that there's a cat in an image. So it's all done, fine, and now I have some new image of a cat and here it is, isn't it cute? And I push it through the network and I say, is there a cat in this image? And the network gives it a probability of 0.8 that there's a cat in the image. Now we could stop there and that's where just, just the prediction side does stop. However, I wanna know why. Why did it think there was a cat in this image? So we can use methods like LRP to trace the decision-making process of the network by going back through the network by a relatively fast algorithm. And ultimately it creates a heat map showing the relevant regions for the network's prediction. In this case, if you look, you see the red colors sort of outline where the cat is. What this tool tells us is the network looked where there's a cat to determine there was a cat. Not terribly insightful. As a human, I looked where there was a cat to, to know if there was a cat in the image. But let me, let me take it a little bit further. There's a very nice paper by the same group that shows how this can be incredibly useful in finding out whether your machine learning method is getting the right answers for the right reasons. So they once again trained a neural network here to decide if there was a horse in the image. And hopefully if you look at these two images, you would agree with me there are horses in both of these in both of these images. Well, the neural network agreed there were also horses in the image. And when they used this LRP method, the red regions here denote where the network said was most relevant for there being a horse. And if you look, first of all, it looks like a disaster. 
But if you sort of squint and tilt your head, you can convince yourself that the red colors overlap where horses are. So once again, the network is looking where there is a horse. Fine, it's looking at specific parts of the horse. Fine, but let's do it again. Let's take another set of three images. Once again, the network also set gave high confidence that there was a horse in each of these three images. But we can use LRP to say, how did the network come to that decision? Where did it look? And if you look at the, these heat maps that you create, it did not look where the horse is. If you, normally if I was in person, I would take, show, have a, take a show of hands. But if you look here, it looked in the bottom left-hand corner of every image. So look at those images carefully. What's in the bottom left-hand corner of each of those images? A copyright symbol. So this network has learned from training over many horse images grabbed from the net, from the web, that if it sees this particular copyright symbol, this German copyright symbol, it's gonna have a horse in the image because that site only has pictures of horses. Okay, now you might say, well, it got the right answer. Fine, but this is that issue I brought up from the very beginning about out of sample training. If I now go out and take a picture of my horse, I don't have one, but if I did, and I input it into this network, it's probably gonna say there's no horse because I don't have the right copyright symbol. So the scientists, this is what we absolutely want to avoid. We're not learning generalizable physical relationships in, in this example, I would argue. So this is one of the reasons this tool is so useful is you can use it to figure out if your network is actually getting the right answers for the right reasons or the wrong ones and adjust accordingly. Now let's return back. If you remember before all the horses, um, we were talking about this human footprint index. So something we did to ensure that our network or to add, give us information about whether our network was making the right answers for the right reasons, is we went in and focused on a few locations across the globe where we saw large change in the human footprint index between the year 2000 and, the 20, and 2019, shown here in red. Now in each of these three sets of images, the leftmost image is the Landsat imagery from 2000, the middle is from 2019, and the right-hand side is this LRP heat map telling us where the network looked when it decided that 2019 had a higher value than 2000. That means humans have impacted the land surface there over the last 20 years. And if we focus in, actually, we, we, we felt pretty good about these results. For example, in Texas, it's picking up some of the roads for where the wind farms have gone up and actually what, how they were able to get the turbines out to where they were. Um, in, in Egypt, they're picking up those, the circles you can see the circles of the edges with those bright colors. And actually an interesting example is in the bottom right hand corner, this art artisanal mining in Indonesia. This originally was not picked up by the original human footprint index. And actually, so our network thought it was getting this one wrong. When we dug in a little further and actually zoomed in with Google Earth, we saw there really is a mine there. And it turns out this mine um, wasn't in any of the documentation that the folks who made the original human footprint index had. And so they put um, that there were no humans, act, no human activity here. And actually the way we, we had to figure out what this was, was actually go in using Google Translate to translate some no local newspapers to find out what was actually going on. So this is a way where these tools can be used then to, to see things maybe we didn't see before. I will point out, it is not perfect, and I'm happy to talk about all the things wrong with this human machine learning human footprint index as well. For example, it does very poorly over the rocky deserts, um, for example, in Australia. All right, so why might, we care, why might you care about XAI? And you might say, I, I'm a scientist, but I really don't care. I just want the right answer, okay? I'm gonna argue you still want to understand how your machine learning algorithm is coming to this decision. One is the reason I already said problematic strategies. Even if you want the right answer for the right, or even if you just want a good answer, you're gonna get the best answer if you're getting it for the right reasons. Another is to build tr general trust. You know, do you think that what you're putting into this network and what you're getting out makes sense and is correct for the right reasons so you can go on maybe and use it um, in another application? I didn't mention this, but actually we use XAI to choose our approach. Landsat has many different channels and we weren't sure which channels to input into our algorithm that would make the best prediction of the human footprint index. So we actually input different groups of channels, in this case, channel one, I'm calling it one, two, and three. And from the heat maps, we saw that channel three was being used the most. And so we were able to remove channels one and two 
to um, save on data storage and training time. And finally, I've already said this is a potential reason to use AI, but it's to learn something new. That is, even if you don't care about the prediction itself, you put your data in and you get out a prediction, maybe you don't care about the prediction, but what you want is to understand how the machine learning algorithm was able to make that prediction in the first place. That is, you can learn from what the network learned within the data. And this is where a lot of the work in my group um, is going, is heading right now. So with that, I'd like to give you two examples of what I mean by this. So example number two is indicator patterns of force change. So if you will, anthropogenic climate change is a great, it is one of the leading force changes we have going on. So when you think about force change, here I have on the left and the right two different maps of, um, of trends in temperature over different decades, just showing that indeed the globe is warming in observations. When we talk about this force change, what do we really mean? Well, there are a few factors going on. One is the patterns of change. What are these patterns? In what variables do we see it? This is showing temperature, but there are many other physical variables that we may care about also show, showing changes with different patterns and amplitudes across the globe. Another is the timing of detection. When might we detect or see these changes amidst all of the climate noise we live in every day, also known as weather? And finally, um, model evaluation. Do our climate models simulate these changes correctly? Are they consistent with one another? Are they consistent with observations? These are all questions that fall under this, this, this heading of detecting force change. So what we did um, was a little weird. We trained a neural network to predict the year of a map from a climate model. So let me, let me talk through this. We have many climate models. Each of them have, are simulating lots of different variables. What we did is we trained a neural network to take a map of annual mean surface temperature, an example shown here on the left, and we wanted, given that single map of one year from one climate model, can it tell me what year it came from? Now, we trained over many different climate model data sets and withheld a set of other climate models that the network never saw before called our testing set to ensure we weren't overfitting and we were again getting right answers for the right reasons. Now, if you think about how in the world is the network going to predict the year from a map? Well, if I were to give you a map that had red all over it, if it was temperature, you would say, ooh, it's really hot. It must be later in the 21st century, right? When, when CO2 continues to cause our atmosphere to warm. If it doesn't look very hot at all, you might think, hey, it might be earlier in the 20th century before climate change has really ramped up. Well, this is exactly what the network is having to do. It has to look for forced change to determine the year. That is, it must learn what regional signals that are reliable indicators of the year. So let me show you an example of what those results look like. It did work, by the way. So on the x-axis is the actual year of every map that we fed the network. And on the y-axis is the predicted year. So a perfect prediction would lie along that one-to-one -one line. The gray, dots, which you can't really see, are the data, is the data that we trained on, and the color dots are the climate model output that we did not show the network while it was training, and so these are the, if you will, the out-of-sample models the network has never seen before, and we ask, how did it do? Now, you might first notice, well, hold on a second, it's doing terribly before about 1970, right? It's predictions. It's always predicting 1950 or so, and this is actually if you think about it, not a fault per se of our network, but what this is telling us is something physical. That is, the network is unable to find patterns of force change in, say, 1930. And it isn't until about the 1970s or so that it catches on to global patterns of force change that are consistent across all the models and says, oh, I know what year it is now. After that, you see that the data falls very nicely, generally along the one to one line as you go out to 2100, when the force, the force change um, in the climate models is very large. Now, you've probably by now noticed that there are white dots on this image. One of the really cool things about the white dots is this is observations. Now, the network was not trained on observations. If you will, that box was trained on climate models alone. But once it was trained, we can input maps of surface temperature from anywhere. And in this case, we chose to input them from the real world and said, hey, network, what year do you think it is? 
And in this case, the network was able to predict the year accurately. That is, the, the white dots generally fall along that one-to-one -one line. What that means is, is, to me, pretty special. It means that the relationships the network is learning within the climate models is applicable to the real world. All right, that's, that's pretty cool. Now, there are lots of other things going on here um, that I'm happy to talk about. Um, but before we go too far, somebody's got to be thinking, this is absurd. Why is she predicting the year? We always know what year it is. No one's going to pay me money to tell them it's 2022 at this point. Why would I ever want to set up a network and put all this effort into training it? Well, I would argue I don't care what the year is, actually. I know what the year is. It's in my data file. But what I want to know is how did the network predict the year? What did the network use in those maps to determine the correct year? And in doing so, I can start to learn reliable indicators of forest change. Specifically, once my network makes a prediction of the year, I can use this heat map method, this LRP method, to track back through the network and give me a heat map, a literal map of the globe, to tell me which regions were most relevant for correctly predicting the year. So here's an example of a map for the year 2015. These are the most relevant regions used by the network when predicting the year 2015. And what we see is there are some pretty, there are some key regions, for example, the Southern Ocean, the North Atlantic, which is largely lines up with the North Atlantic warming hole, as well as Southeast Asia. And I'll return to that one in a minute. Now, I can do this for the year 2015, but remember, neural networks are nonlinear. So that means this same heat map for a different decade or a different year doesn't have to look the same. So, for example, here are heat maps for the most relevant regions for other decades going out to 2095. And you can see that the regions used by the network to predict the year, that is, reliable regions of forced change, vary by decade. Now, at this point, someone sometimes goes, well, hold on, I thought climate change is supposed to cause the whole globe to warm. Why are you only seeing some blotchy patterns, some places and not others? And I wanna be very clear. The climate, ch this, this map, this heat map, if you will, is a combination of four things. The climate change amplitude, that is the map we're used to seeing of red everywhere, but also the internal variability. That is, it is balancing signal to noise here. It is not just the signal. So it's looking for regions with strong climate change responses where the, the noise is low, where the climate models generally agree. This network was trained over many climate models. So if the climate models disagree, it's not gonna find that it, like, a, useful information, uh, a useful region for information. And finally, the neural network is able to take a geospatial combination of all of these bits of information rather than grid point by grid point doing some signal to noise computation. Okay. With that in mind, let's look a little bit closer. So after diving into it a bit, we think that what the signal is in 2015 over Eastern Asia is actually the network picking up on a surface temperature response to aerosols in this region. We find it's only relevant around the turn of the century when the aerosol loading in this region was quite high. Another thing to notice is if you're familiar with climate change trends and maps, you know about probably Arctic amplification the idea that the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the globe. But according to these heat maps, the network isn't really looking in the Arctic. You can't really tell from my projection, but it isn't. It's mostly white. So is my network getting the wrong answer for the, wrong, or the right answer for the wrong reason? No. The thing is, while Arctic amplification is absolutely real, that is just one of the four factors at play here. It turns out while the Arctic is warming very fast, the noise or the level of the variance in the Arctic temperatures is also huge. That is, the signal to noise is still quite small. On top of that, climate models generally disagree on the, the timing on the loss of Arctic sea ice. And so the neural network is combining all of this and saying, hey, the Arctic is not a good place for me to look in determining the year. I'm gonna look elsewhere to try to make a better prediction. Okay, so we can do that with climate models, but there's nothing stopping us from using this heat map a method for observations itself. That is, we can actually go in, um, so the top is anomalies from the year 1997 that were actually observed. This is what we saw in real life. And when we push this through the network, it turns out the neural network predicted 1997 exactly. I, I cannot believe that's more of just a little fluke. That's amazing to me. 
but it guessed 1997, which it was. And now we can ask the question, where did the network look to know it was 1997? In this case, for the observations, we actually see a slightly different map than we did for the climate models. That is, the network is putting a lot of its emphasis over the Southern Ocean, as well as off the coast of um, Southern Africa. Now, something important to note here um, is El Nino. I chose 1997 for a reason. It was a very strong El Nino year, as you can see in the top plot. The network is not using that region to make its prediction as you can see. So this is not merely just telling you where the anomalies are big. That would actually be quite boring. We didn't need a fancy neural network to do that. Now, why isn't it using this region? The anomalies are huge. Well, knowing it's an El Nino or a La Nina doesn't tell you anything about climate change or what year it is. Now, it could if you're thinking about changes in El Nino, but that's a few orders of magnitude away from what we're talking about here. So the network has actually learned that the region, this um, Pacific Warm Tongue region, is actually an unreliable location to focus on because it has such high variance that is not useful in determining the year. And you can see that again in the heat map that the, this region is not used by the neural networks when it's making its decision of the year. Okay, so that's just with surface temperature. In our papers, we look at precip as well, but a master student um, of mine, Jamin Rader, recently finished a study where he said, well, why are we using all these variables separately? As a climate scientist with a small brain, I can only think about one at the same time, but a neural network is powerful. We should be able to input lots of variables at the same time. Shouldn't we be able to identify change a little faster or in slightly different regions? So what he's doing is he's including seasonal information as well as including temperature and precipitation together. That is a single input instead of one map now is eight maps, the four seasons of temperature and the four seasons of precipitation. And when he does this and predicts the year, we have the same types of plots as before, um, and for the combined variables being on the far right here in yellow, he finds that we actually can detect change faster when we combine information rather than in any one variable or any one season alone. This is not surprising. Give it more information that's useful, it's going to do a better job, but he showed this quantitatively in a very nice way. Now, once again, we can use our heat map um, explainable AI method to track back through the network and ask how where did it look, which seasons were most useful or reliable indicators, which variables. One of the nice things I like about this approach is we can actually cop up with a map for precipitation that provides unique information beyond temperature. We all know that temperature is the fingerprint, if you will, of climate warming. There's no question about that. And indeed, our, our neural network uses temperature the most, as it should. But this allows us to actually find the locations of precipitation that are unique and separate from what the temperature fields are already giving us. And just for comparison, sometimes people at this point are like, ah, oh, there's too many new things with AI. Here's a nice good old signal to noise map to give you a different, uh, a different interpretation. So indeed, the neural network is looking for regions of high signal to noise ratio, but it doesn't need to use all of them equally. And it's able to combine those regions together to make a final prediction. Okay, so in my last few minutes here, I wanna talk about example three, which is a little different. Up until now, we've been de detecting force change, that is climate change. Now I wanna detect mechanisms that are driving global temperatures, be it force change from humans or low frequency decadal variability. So we know we have increasing global, temp global mean temperatures, the climate is warming, it's because of us, right? Um, but even so, there are still wiggles throughout this temperature record. For example, the well-known warming slowdown, sometimes called the hiatus of the 2000s. And so what Zach Lave, a postdoc in my group did, is he said, can we predict these warming slowdowns before they happen? Can we train a neural network to help us see that this trend is going to be decreased slightly because of potentially internal variability or some other um, method. And here we're taking an internal variability approach. And I will point out there's a huge body of literature on lots of reasons for why we observe the warming slowdown. Here we are taking one of them. Specifically, he takes maps of ocean heat content, puts it through the network and has the network predict if the next 10 years will show a warming slowdown or not a warming slowdown, defined some way. Once that network is able to make that prediction, he then once again uses 
explainable AI to look back and ask where in the ocean to key content map did the network look in order to know that our, we would be undergoing a global um, slowdown in global temperature trends. When he does this, he ends up with a plot that looks something like this. The top plot shows that LRP heat map. It's not looking everywhere on the globe at all. It's actually looking in the off equatorial regions. Um, and what ends up happening is we interpret this as the neural network is learning this anomalous ocean heat content that turns out resembles transitions in the phase of the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, which is a well-known low frequency mode of variability. That it is that it, it's identifying when these transitions are about to occur because these transitions are known to lead to um, uh, cooling um, under climate variability alone. Now we can go one more step and say, all right, can we just in general predict these transitions of low frequency variability modes in our climate system? So a PhD student in my group, Emily Gordon, is actually training a neural network to predict transitions in what's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, a, a similar flavor oscillation to um, what I just showed you from Zach's work. Specifically, sh what she asks is, um, given that, uh, given a certain, in this case, ocean heat content maps, once again, can we predict if over uh, the next 30 months we will see a transition in this low frequency mode of variability? Specifically, if she inputs these three maps down here, can we see whether there will be a transition of this index over the zero line in the next 30 months? Once again, knowing that this is happening may help us foresee changes in these global mean temperatures. All right, so does it work? Yes. Then she uses LRP to ask, where in the ocean did you look? And what's, sorry, I went backwards. Okay, what's really neat about this example is she split it into transitions from positive to negative and negative to positive and found different answers. Once again, this highlights the power of neural nonlinear neural networks. They don't need to assume that going one direction is the same as going the other. Specifically, what she found is going from positive to negative, so the left-hand side. Um, the, the neural network looks at negative ocean heat contact anomalies in the off equatorial Western Tropical Pacific, shown in the pink box. And it turns out there are studies in our, in our field suggesting that this is exactly the mechanism that leads to transitions in the PDO. However, on the right-hand side, those regions did not come out as, import, as, as important as the North Atlantic, which surprised us. It turns out, we think, what's going on is this specific type of transition of low frequency variability is linked to the Atlantic because this region can drive um, teleconnections that drive El Nino, which in turn can drive transitions. So that is, we think the neural network is recognizing distinct transition mechanisms that we can then go back, form hypotheses like we normally would, and test um, in other ways as well. Okay, so I'm at my wrap up here. Just to end, um, I just went through quite a few exa little examples. But let's zoom out for a minute about AI and climate. So there are a few re re um, topics that I think are really exciting right now. One is knowledge-guided machine learning. The idea that as a scientist, why are we throwing F, and F equals MA out the window and just saying, just let the data figure it out? Isn't there a way to fuse scientific knowledge and AI to do better science? And there are a lot of people now thinking about this and how we might do it. In my group, the approach I take actually is often just thinking about the setup alone is bringing physics in to the problem. For example, I don't think a computer scientist alone would have thought to predict the year, that that would have been a useful thing to do. But as a scientist, I'm bringing my knowledge in that that might actually not be a waste of time. There are other ways like actually putting in physical constraints like conservation of energy, conservation of mass that people are exploring as well. Another really exciting avenue is called transfer learning. The idea that, and this is very similar by the way to data assimilation, the concept that we can train a neural network say on imperfect climate model data, and we know it's not perfect because it learned from imperfect data, right? Our climate models are not perfect. They're wonderful tools though. And then what we do is with the little amount of observations we have, we update that network to try to do a slightly better job on the observations than it was before. And there are examples already in the literature showing how transfer learning can indeed improve in this example, um, and so forecasts out to about 12 months. And finally, very generally, 
people are exploring lots of different ways to use machine learning to just generally improve climate model projections. This could be making or creating better convective and radiative parameterizations. Sure, that's the one I think that's getting the most press right now. But there's also exploring relationships within this climate system simulated in these projections. How can we use machine learning to better compare and evaluate our models against observations? I gave an example about how, um, or and actually in the paper, we go through an example of how we can use our trained neural network to learn about climate model biases. And finally, how can, we how can we intelligently use these methods to explore bias correcting and narrowing uncertainties? Again, you might say, well, we've been doing this already. Absolutely. But this is yet another tool that might help us attack this problem in a slightly different way. So my closing thoughts here, um, I wanna remind everybody that these tools are not just for weather predictions. People doing weather just wanna predict something. No, it's for all of us. The science can, you can incorporate science, the science can be what the network learns. Um, and more often than not, scientists want more than just a prediction. They want to know why. And so I think it, these explainability and interpretable machine learning methods are a game changer for scientific research because we can actually use them to set out to answer the questions we, we, we want to know. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Barnes. If anyone has any questions, we have about 13 minutes um, until Dr. Barnes has a different um, meeting. So um, if anyone has any questions, they can go ahead and unmute themselves or raise their hands. I see Sumant, um, you have your hand raised. Hi, uh, my question, very nice talk. Uh, uh, my question was, uh, if I use EOFs, for example, and play the game that you were playing in figuring out which year it was, uh, the EOFs can do this very easily because I, I go through a hundred year record. I have principal components for various modes. So I take a particular, you know, you give me a map. I project it. I find the principal components and I go and look up my table. So my question is. The, the real question is not whether AI could pick out that year, but whether it beats linear regression or correlation analysis that is embedded in EOF analysis, for example. Can you do better than that as a tool? Is the real power of AI not just picking the ears? Yeah, so so a few thoughts. Um, one is uh, lots of thoughts. Okay, so first of all, yes, this beats linear methods. We show that in the paper. Okay. Um, se yep, so secondly, EOFs do have, uh, I have no problem. So actually, EOFs in, from computer scientists from, from computer science, they will tell you that is an unsupervised machine learning technique. Great. So some will even put that there. Um, the reason that, and there are people thinking about detection using EOFs and pattern fingerprinting, et cetera. That's Great. already a thing people do. One of the powers I think here of the AI is it's the nonlinearity, first of all. The fact that EOFs, if, you, if you're doing it globally, require that, that sine or that cosine function fit the whole globe. Now you can certainly have 100 EOFs when you can start to get more and more regional scale. But one of the things I like is the AI out, out of the gate does not assume any spatial structure at all. And if there was only one tiny region on the globe that was of import, it would find that one. Whereas EOFs like to be, if you will, due to their orthogonality constraints and their scale and domain constraints, have, have are limited in what they can come up with. With that said, I think a, this is an important point that AI is not always the end all be all. It's actually incredibly simple and easier to do what I just showed you here, I think, than many of these EOF methods because the coding has come so far that to train these networks is about two lines of code, um, with, which can be dangerous too. But one thing I think that in my group we see it as is we have this tool that can do so much more than just compute an EOF. So we can use it, start to understand our system, and then ask the question, well, is there an easier way to get to the same answer now that we know what the answer is? So in some cases, we find out that we didn't know our system was as linear as it was. We find out it was that we didn't need all the extra nonlinearity from our AI, and then we very confidently can go back to multilinear regression, knowing that it was the best choice. So I, do, I don't wanna sell this as it will always beat everybody's method because it won't, but we have found it incredibly helpful to know what to try next. 
No, and it didn't come across that okay, way either. Good. I good. was just so sorry. I was just <laughs> thinking that the benchmark for, uh, needed to be yep. more than what other methods that we already know very well uh, can yep, do. You got it. Yep. 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 Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suman. Um, Mike Evans, you can um, unmute yourself as well. Yeah, hi, thanks. This was fascinating and it was really, really clear. So thank you for that. Great. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the detection of emergent phenomena, like basically mm -hmm. interaction. And um, as a secondary question, I suppose, it's like if it's something that we've never seen before um, and you detect it, how do, how do you know, how do you validate that out of sample if it's like the first time you've seen it? I mean, yeah. Oh, up there. Thanks. So your first question is just about generally about emergent constraints. Is that what you just? No, it's about emergent phenomena, like something that oh, I because see. of an interaction between two yep. things which are happening at the same time, yep. and it's not linear like Sumat was was suggesting. Yep. Yep. So so I think maybe so first of all. Emergent phenomena is what this is trying to do, these methods, right? They're trying to look in the data for relationships that we may or may not have known about. I think your the, your secondary question is far, far more important, which you know, in the end is if we've never seen it before and we've never hypothesized it, how in the world can we be sure it's real? Or are we just doing our horse issue with the copyright symbol? And for all we know, we overfitted and are learning, we, we aren't learning anything useful. Um, so I've heard some people try to answer this in a very fancy way. I, I, my answer to you is we can't be sure. Just like as scientists, we are always trying a lot of different methods to test and poke at our, at our data and our hypotheses. So I see this as one of many steps that we're already doing. So forget AI, let's go back to EOFs. I just compute EOF five and I decide this may be a really important climate phenomenon. What would I do next? Well, I'd look in observations. I'd look in our climate models. Are those also EOF five? I would maybe design an experiment where I would poke at something or other to see if I could excite that EOF. I think the exact same steps need to be done with hypotheses driven from machine learning as well. So I mentioned some comments about the aerosol forcing. Um, you know, in the climate models versus we think maybe this is detecting a mechanisms for PDO transitions. I think this is where normal climate science takes over and we go and we design a really nice GCM idealized modeling experiment. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't think the machine learning can do that in any special way. And I, I don't think we should, I personally right now, and I'm happy to be proven wrong. I don't think we should try to make it do that either because we've been doing science for, a very long time and are finding over and over. We just got to poke and prod a lot of different ways before we can be confident in our results with causality. So, but it's sorry. Does, right? my, does, right? does, yeah, my right? answer is, yeah, we're just as much in trouble as we always have been. But, but it does raise the possibility of detecting nonlinearities. Um, yes. Really, really interesting. Yeah. And, and actually something in my group that I always remind them is, you know, five years ago, before I started using these tools, I would have said, assuming linearity, and then I would have done a bunch of work. Now we get to say, we don't have to assume linearity. And if it comes out linear, we can be that much more confident that that was a good assumption in the first place. So we're actually having a lot of fun with that. So we have another question from Lauren Zamora. Uh, hi. Yeah, so uh, I was curious. Um, so, so you you mentioned some places where the model was less good. So, for example, mm -hmm. areas where the data were very variable, the input data, or for example, data areas where the data were biased in some way. And so, I know, like in kind of more traditional data analysis, um, there are other things also that can go wrong. Like, for example, you might have low sample number, and so you have high random error, or you might have autocorrelation because in some places, there might be, you know, one thing that dominates for a long period of time or something like that. So I was just wondering, can your can your method deal with those other kind of uh, issues that kind of pop up in normal data analysis? I mean, I shouldn't say normal, but in the, the data analysis, I'm not sure. Yeah. So one comment is about autocorrelation or collinearity. These tools are fantastic for that, in part because they're so in easy to 
build in regularization techniques that allow it to consider the fact that there's collinearity and autocorrelation. So in that sense, I think this is the tool to use if you're worried about lots of variables that do pretty similar things. So I'm not, I don't see that as an issue. That's actually a strength of these methods given all the tools we have. However, you brought up where you have low sample size. Great point. These tools require data. If you don't have a lot of data, there's nothing to learn. They're a terrible idea. I always make the joke to my group. If you have four data points, are you going to fit a 10th order polynomial? Of course not. You would never do that. So then I say, so why do you think a machine learning algorithm with a thousand parameters should be used to fit your 50 data points? The answer is it shouldn't. If you only have 10 data points, please just fit a line. Okay, like don't, don't do anything else. So with that in mind, Data, so we always hear that these tools are very data hungry. They're data hungry if you're trying to learn thousands of parameters to fit that data. However, if you're training a very simple neural network with just 10 parameters, like a 10th order polynomial, then you don't need as much data. So in that sense, Lauren, I think many of the issues you're raising about typical data analysis, you still absolutely have to consider here, which is why I'm very passionate about saying this this world of climate and AI needs the climate. It needs the climate scientists because we understand our data. We understand what pre-processing is doing. We understand the results. That's not to say that there isn't room for collaboration. The opposite. I think it's awesome. But I keep telling my students, I don't think computers are going to take over your job anytime soon um, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. And our speaker does have a hard deadline at three o'clock, which is three minutes. Um, I don't think we, I don't think she can. Do you want to try to answer another question or? Yeah, I'll take one more. Okay. Okay. Thank Michelle's been taking waiting care for of a minute. Me. Michelle's been waiting yeah. for a minute. Michelle, you can unmute yourself. Hi, great talk, Libby. Um, I, I have this fear that you just answered this question, but um, I'll, 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 I'll ask it again. You can answer it a different way. Um, but yeah, so we're at the Climate Prediction Center. I I sometimes come across these simple um, neural network models that are trained on very small samples um, because in seasonal climate, we just simply don't have that many samples. Even like 50 years of data um, for a prediction is a little nerve wracking. So I was curious, like, do you have like a rule of thumb for a, your test training set, like what kind of sample sizes would you encourage us to kind of stay away from? Um, you know, it's like, is there, it, yeah, the, you know, like no as, you said, as you said, you could fit a line. And so we end up, yeah. end up using linear regression a lot because of this. Um, is, is there, is there a sample size that's just too small? No, just like I would, you would never probably say there's a sample size that's too small to fit a line. It's so data dependent. It's so dependent on whether it is a line or not in the first place. With that said, what I have found is if you are doing seasonal prediction, let's say, um, and you only have 50 samples, here, this is, I'm going to take my sort of pessimistic or climate science approach. My guess is some simple neural network is not going to find a relationship that you haven't found by just making maps of all 50 and staring at them for a while. It's going to pull out the things you already know. Okay. The power of these tools is when you have so much data, I always joke, use machine learning when you would never have printed every map out and laid it on your floor. Okay, that's where maybe you sort of have enough data because honestly, Michelle, I don't think it's going to find something that you don't already know, you know, with that little amount of information in the first place. The other trick is it's probably going to learn things that are boring to you that you already knew, but you don't know how to extract. Like you're looking for the nuances or the third order effect, but it's just going to tell you that, you know, El Nino and La Nina are a thing. Huh. Um, Right, which yes, you're gonna, yes. so, so yeah, you don't want that, and it is not a useful use of these tools. That's when we should go back and just do it the way we've done it personally. All right, great. But there's no hard number. So yeah, sorry. no, no, that does help. Yeah, um, I, I do think okay. like in, in the community at large, the uh, reviewing a lot of these papers is a little bit yeah. of a struggle for this reason, though. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry I have to run. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to email them. I love talking about this. If you couldn't tell, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, thank Professor. You. Thanks. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, we will have a recording of this available um, by the end of the week. Um, and we have a, another seminar next week. Um, thanks so much. And if anybody had any last minute questions or comments, um, you can just send them to me and I'll connect them with the speaker.